Talk to me. Talk to me. Hello and welcome. I'm Dan Gersten, host of Chatting with History, where you can listen into conversations that I have with some of the most famous characters in the history of Western civilization. And today's guest is no exception. It's George Washington, to whom is attributed first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. So without further delay, let's meet George Washington. Mr. President, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan. You know, it's a real pleasure to be back here in Lexington, Massachusetts. It's the birthplace of American liberty. And please, just call me George. You know, I'm not really into those formalities. It's one of the reasons I didn't want to become king. So around here, most people just call me George. Well, except for Martha, that is. And what does Mrs. Washington call you? As general and as president, I felt it was important to learn the art of diplomacy. So in that spirit, I prefer not to answer that question. So why don't you tell us about your childhood? My father, he was Augustine Washington. Now, he was a tobacco planter. His grandfather, my great-grandfather, John, they immigrated over from England to the Virginia colony. I think that was around 1657. My mom, she was Mary Ball Washington. Now, she was Dad's second wife. I was the oldest child from that marriage. Now, all in all, Dad had nine kids. But sadly, only six of them made it past the age of 12. And, you know, from what I've learned, uh, you were affected by the passing of a loved one. My dad passed away when I was only 11. And at that point, my half-brother Lawrence, he became my surrogate father. And let's talk a little bit about your relationship with your father. I mean, perhaps the most commonly known tale about the two of you uh, concerns a cherry tree that you chopped down and when asked by your father about it, I mean, proclaimed your guilt and said something to the effect that you could not tell a lie. <laughs> that old story. It's quite bogus, you know. Really? Made up by somebody named Weems. There's no truth to it whatsoever. So the tale about your honesty is itself dishonest? <laughs> Welcome to Washington. You think that spinning the truth and making up stories about political leaders is a recent behavior? Au contraire, my friend. Besides, wasn't it Lincoln that put honesty in his name? Not me. So back to when your dad died and your half-brother Lawrence took over. I mean, there were others besides Lawrence who were role models, no? Oh, yeah. See, Larry, he married into the Fairfax family. They were one of the most powerful families in Virginia. And it was with his father-in-law, William Fairfax. He was a formal influence on me. And in fact, it was his connection to the Fairfaxes that, well, they got me appointed official surveyor for Culpeper County. And, I mean, there were other factors to you getting noticed. You know, being six foot two didn't hurt. Towering over my contemporaries. Well, it gave me, oh, how should I put this? Gave me a different perspective on a lot of things. And then, Lawrence passed away. You know, it's sad, really. He contracted tuberculosis. So then in 1751, he and I traveled to Barbados. Now, we were hoping that the climate there would be good for him. And yeah, it wasn't. Shortly after our return in 1752, he died. You know, I've heard his death turned out to be the beginning of your military career. That was true. See. When Larry died, he was commander of the Virginia militia. And afterwards, 1753, Governor Dinwiddie, he divided the position up into four offices. And I was appointed to one of them. I was given the rank of major. And not a bit too soon. Oh yeah. Seems a war, which you know as the French and Indian War, it was brewing. See, the French began to expand their military control over eh, what we call the Ohio country. Now, just about that same time as England and the colonies of Virginia and Pennsylvania, well, they sought to expand there, too. I understand is that you were involved in the conflict even before it became a conflict. It's true. See, late 1753, Governor Dinwiddie, well, he sent me to contact the French and basically asked them to leave, which they refused to do so. Then on a later trip to that region, we ambushed a small detachment of French troops we killed their leader. Well, this kind of escalated things. Why is that not a surprise? Then, 1754, the French attacked the fort that I was at, and they captured me. Really? It's quite embarrassing when you come to think about it. But still, it's not like today, where prisoners of war, they're tortured and they're mistreated. 
You know, shortly after I was captured, I was set free. And I was allowed to return with my troops back to Virginia. Well, soon after that, in 1755, both England and France, they sent more troops to that region. And then a war was formally declared. I think that was 1756. You know, without going into detail regarding the war, uh, how did that experience prepare you for the future? Well, I was able to gain military and political leadership skills. And that would help me later on. I was able to closely observe the British military tactics, and that proved invaluable during the Revolution. I experienced victory and defeat. I learned how to lead men, and I saw the importance of having a strong civilian government and the drawbacks of a colonial-run militia. So now what? I returned back to Mount Vernon, took up the family business. We were growing tobacco. Then. 1759, I married Martha Dandridge Custis. She was a wealthy widow. And together we raised two children. You didn't have any children of your own? No, I didn't. Now, it's always thought that the smallpox I had when I was on Barbados with my brother, well, that may have made me sterile. But regardless of the reason, reality was, when I was a soldier, I was fire and blank. When did you get interested in politics? I was always interested in politics. I just really didn't get active till 1769. Now, that's when I presented a proposal to the Virginia Assembly. And we wanted to ban the import goods from England. What was that about? We were getting sick and tired of, of England levying taxes against us to keep them afloat. Now, it started with the Stamp Act in 1765. That basically had us paying to keep their troops here, as if we needed them. Still. England just kept taxing the colonies. Yeah, they viewed us as some kind of cash cow. While well, at the same time, they were treating us like second-class citizens. And there was violence as a result. Sadly, there was. But you know, I felt they left us little choice. See, in 1768, England passed the Townsend Act. That was a series of laws, and some of which were levied taxes on us to pay the salaries of governors and judges that we didn't elect, nor did we appoint. My resistance was so strong that the British troops, they had to occupy Boston in a situation that eventually resulted in the Boston Massacre of 1770. And was it a massacre? Was Kent State a massacre? Let me put it this way. We had five civilians killed. We had another 11 of them injured when the British Redcoats, they felt threatened by what they considered a mob, and they fired into it. And did this stop England from taxing the colonies? Not really. While they repealed some of that Townsend Act, they kept some of it in place. Then in 1773, they passed the Tea Act. So how did the colonies react to this? Not well. Colonists in New York and Philadelphia, they forced the British ships to return back to England with the tea still on board. And in Charleston, the tea was left on the docks to rot. And in Boston, they refused to take the tea off the boat even though the royal governor, he was determined to leave the ships in port. Well, then what? Well, a group of colonists in Boston, they boarded the ships. They destroyed the tea by throwing it over into the harbor. That event, that's known as the Boston Tea Party. Some party, huh? Yeah, but not for the British. If anything, the Boston Tea Party had united groups in England against the colonies. So in 1774, Parliament passed what we referred to as the Intolerable Act. And where were you in all of this? I viewed the Intolerable Acts as an invasion of our rights and our privileges. So in 1774, I chaired a meeting and we called for a convention of the Continental Congress. Later on, I was selected as a delegate to that Congress. What came out of that? We agreed to boycott British goods. And if the Intolerant Acts weren't repealed, we'd stop shipping goods to them. And also, we called for a second Continental Congress, and that was in May of 1775, and we were to plan our next course of action. But your next course of action seems to have been decided before the Second Continental Congress met. Yeah, in April of 1775, after the battles of Lexington and Concord, the colonies went to war. Lexington and Concord? In New Hampshire? No! Lexington and Concord are in Massachusetts. Now, any person who cares enough about this country and how it was formed, well, they ought to know that. And you call yourself an American. Oh, 
the idea that there are people who aspire to hold the highest office in this land, my office, and they don't know where the shot heard round the world was fired. Well, you know, that really pisses me off. Uh, so back to the colonies going to war. Uh, how were you with this? I felt it was inevitable, given the course that England had taken. In fact, I appeared before the Second Continental Congress in my full military uniform. And on June 14, 1775, Congress created the Continental Army. I was nominated by John Adams from Massachusetts. I was appointed Major General and Commander-in-Chief. I was responsible for the plotting and overall strategy of the war, and importantly, keeping everybody focused on the common goal of winning the war and gaining our independence. Obviously, that was a smart move. Well, thank you. In retrospect, it certainly appears that way. But you know, there were times when this war just wasn't going well. We were defeated on numerous occasions. In battle, I was repeatedly outmaneuvered by British generals with larger armies. And in 1776, I was nearly captured when we lost New York City. I mean, how did you get things to swing around? I was able to cross the Delaware with my troops. and I defeated the enemy in the Battle of Trenton and the Battle at Princeton. I was able to retake New Jersey, and I restored the momentum to our patriot cause. Yeah, tell me about crossing the Delaware. You know, things just weren't going well. We were in a retreat mode. So to change things around, I staged a comeback. And on the night of December 25th, 1776, I led my army across the Delaware River in a surprise attack on a Hessian outpost. Oh, I was quite successful. We captured nearly a thousand of them in Trenton, and I followed it up with a victory over the British regulars at Princeton. I, I gotta know, so in crossing the Delaware, I mean, were you standing in one of the boats? <laughs> well, you know, Dan, I can't tell a lie. Now, maybe I was, maybe I wasn't. What do you think? Well, I think that was a very presidential response if I ever heard one. So, back to the war. I mean, it's now 1777. We were lucky that year. How so? Well, the British, they had launched a major initiative an invasion army under, under Burgoyne, I call him Burgie, he was sent south from Quebec, and his intentions were to split New England off from the rest of the colonies. And General Howe, out of New York, he was supposed to link up with Burgie, but instead, he headed south toward Philadelphia. And all the while, he beat me in a number of battles, and he actually marched into Philadelphia. He left Burgie out of reach of any help which that led to his being trapped, and he surrendered his entire army at Saratoga. And that was a turning point of the war. How so? See, our victory at Saratoga, that inspired the French to openly ally with us. And then the winter came. Oh, I'll say. With winter setting in, boy, I sought winter quarters for my men. So in December 1777, my army of about 12,000 men we struggled into Valley Forge, and about, that's about 18 miles north of Philadelphia. And by the time we left there in June of 1778, we had lost two to 3,000 men, mainly due to exposure, plus wounds and disease. Yes, but when you did leave, I mean, the army was in the best shape it had ever been. It's true. Now, some believe that Valley Forge was a victory not of weapons, but of will. Though the days were an ordeal, we emerged stronger and more united than ever before. It was largely due to Baron von Steuben. Now, he was a former member of the Prussian army, and he offered his services to us. And he came with a letter from Benny of introduction. Benny? Yeah, Benny Franklin. Anyhow, I put Steuben in charge of training, and he did a masterful job. It was largely due to him that this ragtag army that we had set out in the beginning of the war with was now a smart-looking and acting fighting machine. So in June 1778, you left Valley Fort. Oh, yes. See, the British, they had evacuated Philadelphia, and they began moving back to New York. So I decided to shadow them. And in one of the war's biggest battles, I attacked them at Monmouth, and I fought them to a draw. Afterwards, they continued on to New York, and I moved the army just outside of it. Well, now seems like a good time for us to take a break. So don't go away, and we'll be right back with Chatting with History. Until then, don't go off and fight any battles.
Hello and welcome back to Chatting with History. I'm Dan Gersten and my guest today is George Washington. We've followed his story from the time he was a child right up through the Revolutionary War. So why don't we get back to our story? So Mr. President, uh, George, uh, you, you followed the British uh, out of uh, Philadelphia and now they're holed up in New York and, and, and you have them surrounded. So now what? Well, it's pretty much a stalemate. Oh, there were skirmishes and small battles throughout the colonies, but nothing major. Yeah, but that was soon to change. Thanks to our French allies. In July 1780, about 5,000 veteran French troops, led by Rochambeau, they arrived at Newport, Rhode Island, to hear some jabs. Well, and help us too. Plus, France, they provided 20,000 in gold to help fund the Continental Army. Meanwhile, in addition to having the British hold up in New York, we managed to trap them in Virginia, at Yorktown. So why don't you tell me about Yorktown? Well, see, the British, they were, they were seeking to expand their military efforts. They ordered Lieutenant General Lord Cornwallis to build a deep water port in Virginia, which he started doing. He started at Yorktown. And about this time, the French fleet, well, it was sailing from the French West Indies, and they were to provide assistance either New York or Virginia. Well, then what? When the French Admiral chose to head to Virginia, Rochambeau and I, we moved our combined forces south from New York to Yorktown. All the while, we were engaging in tactics that made the British think that we were still laying siege in New York. Interesting. You know, just like um, what was done for D-Day, I mean, leading the Germans to believe we were going to land somewhere other than Normandy. And just where do you think they got that idea from? Yeah, General, General Washington. Well, then what? The French fleet arrived in Chesapeake Bay. It was August 1781. By September, it defeated the British fleet that came to relieve Cornwallis. Later that month, Rochi and I arrived with our forces. We completely surrounded Cornwallis. Soon after we began our bombardment and just plain blasting the crap out of them, well, October 17th, Cornwallis. He's asking for terms of surrender. And that ended the war? Yes and no. What it did do is open up the peace process, which as you know, that can take several years. Well, hell, you know, the one in the Middle East has been going on for decades, I mean, if not longer. Well, this process lasted about two years. And then we ended it with the Treaty in Paris, and we signed it in September, 1783. However, between Yorktown and that treaty being signed, we never really could be sure the war was over. Especially since we had British troops, well, they still had about 25,000 troops occupying New York City, Charleston, and Savannah, along with a still powerful fleet. And with the departure of the French Army and Navy, well, we were kind of on our own during this potentially shaky time. Let's hop it off. The Treasury was empty. Unpaid soldiers were growing restless, almost to the point of a coup d'etat. Wow. I mean, this part of the story we're not really told about. Yes, it got pretty hairy. I was able to squelch the unrest, and Congress came up with a promise of a five-year bonus. The British, they finally left New York City in late November of 1783. And I resigned my commander-in-chief in December of that year. You know, before we go on, why don't you tell me about the Declaration of Independence? Oh, sure. Though I really had nothing to do with it. And it was a good thing, too. Why is that? Well, I had a war to run. Now, besides, the way I heard it went down, way too political for me. All those debates and those arguments. You think today's Congress is divisive? You should have been around back then. I had delegates fighting over whether to be independent or not. It got quite emotional. And some of the delegates walked out. Well, finally. They got their act together and they voted to accept the document that Tommy and the others, they worked so hard on. Now still, not all the members of the Continental Congress at that time signed the document. Tommy? Yeah, Thomas Jefferson. Okay, so how did you feel about the Declaration? Well, I was in favor of independence. Why else was I fighting and sending men into battle where they could die? You know, it must have been a hard thing despite the worthy cause. Uh, anyhow, you know, what did you do after the war? I retired back to Mount Vernon. Went to be with Martha and the family. 
that was short-lived. How so? Seems they couldn't do without me. And in the summer of 1787, they wanted me to attend some convention in Philadelphia to draft some kind of constitution. Well, you went, didn't you? Yes, I did. More than the kids were starting to bother me so, I figured heading to Philadelphia might not be such a bad thing. Plus, I liked hanging out with Johnny and Benny and Tommy and a few of the others. Boy, that Benny, he's some character. So he could get on your nerves. In fact, one time, he irritated me so much, I told him to just go fly a kite. So what was your role at the convention? Well, while the delegates unanimously elected me president of the convention, I chose not to really participate in any debates, though I did vote on various articles. My role was basically to maintain order and a spirit of fellowship, and to make sure that the delegates focused on the task at hand. Plus. It seems that they had designed this presidency with me in mind. So my presence somehow ensured that the new constitution would be ratified by all 13 states. And you were elected as our first president in 1789 and re-elected in 1792. Oh yes, that was quite an honor and a privilege. I also understand that you refused to be paid. Well, yes, they offered me a salary of $25,000 and I turned it down. Now, separate from the fact that I was wealthy, I wanted to portray myself as a selfless public servant. However, Congress wisely got me to accept that salary to avoid setting a precedent where the presidency would only be perceived and limited to the independently wealthy individuals. Still, I feel the system today has been corrupt. I perceive that too many of today's public servants, they're in it more for the power and the money than to serve the people. Sadly, I see it that way too. You know, anyhow, you've been given high grades for a president, you know, especially since you had no one before you as a role model. Well, thank you. You know, being first, I knew that whatever I did would set a president. So I was mindful of what I did and how I behaved. I paid special attention to the pomp and ceremony of the office. And to make sure that we never emulated that European royalty, and that's why I preferred the title of Mr. President over things like Your Highness. <laughs> In addition, I surrounded myself with good people whom I could delegate and share ideas and gather advice. All the while, we were keeping people focused on the common goal of doing what's best for the people of this new nation. Domestically, uh, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced? You know, to begin with, I wasn't a member of any political party. They began to form around Alex, Secretary of Treasury, and Tommy, Secretary of State. You know, they were constantly at each other. It was so much that I had to send each of them to their rooms on more than a couple of occasions. Oh, then in 1791, some of the people in the frontier districts, oh, they got real upset when Congress, they decided to tax their booze. <laughs> This became known as the Whiskey Rebellion. I had to send troops, which I commanded to put down that protest. Alex? Yeah, Alexander Hamilton. You know that guy who does those bank commercials? Hmm, okay. You know, so what were some of the challenges uh, from a foreign policy perspective? Well, 1793, France and Britain, they're, they're at it again, and a major war broke out, and that's gonna last up to 1815. France, of course. They wanted us to ally with them, and there were many, including Tommy, who felt we should. <laughs> However, we're a young nation, and we still had British soldiers and forts all around the Great Lakes. Well, with cabinet approval, I proclaimed American neutrality. In 1794, we actually signed the Jay Treaty with Britain, and that led to them withdrawing their troops from the Great Lakes and it opened up the British West Indies to American trade. Looking back, I mean, what are some of the things you're especially proud about? Certainly keeping us out of war. And also, when I put down that Whiskey Rebellion, oh, I was able to show that the federal government could and would use military force to exert its authority over states and citizens, which was really important when establishing a strong central government. 
And lastly, of course, I was able to select a specific location for the permanent seat of our government. I oversaw the efforts of what in 1791 was named the city of Washington in the territory of Columbia. Yeah, it was very appropriately named, too. You only served two terms, uh, even though many wanted you to run for a third. Yeah, I didn't really want to serve that second term, but I felt I had to. Why? The rancor between Alex and Tommy and all the political parties each had created was just so bitter. I felt the country just might be torn apart in my absence of leadership. So anyhow, when that second term was up, you could just stick a fork right in me. I was so done. So in 1797, you left office. I headed back to Mount Vernon, and I devoted much of my time to farming and the other business. I even had a distillery. And in 1798, uh, Johnny, uh, President Adams, he asked me to help plan a provisional army to, you know, to meet any emergencies that just might arise, which I did that for about a year and a half. And I caught my death of cold and I died December 14th, 1799, at the age of 67. Well, we've just about run out of time and I'd like to thank you, George, for coming on the show. Meanwhile, as is customary, um, any parting words for our audience? To begin with, if you're running for a national office, you need to learn about the nation that you're seeking to govern and particularly about our early history and the issues for which we're fighting. There are those that have to pass a test to become a citizen and who know more about this country than do the people who presently seek office. And they were born here. Perhaps we ought to have them take some type of history and citizenship test before they can run. Now, secondly, in my farewell address upon leaving the presidency, I warned against bitter partisanship in domestic politics. I call for men to move beyond partisanship and to serve the common good. Well, so much for that warning. Partisanship now runs amok in the city named for me and throughout this land. The common good is no longer common. And I and the Founding Fathers, oh, we are not happy. And thirdly, and I also, in my farewell address, I urged people to place their identity as Americans along with their independence and liberty above and beyond any slight differences. Now, sadly, there are those who profit from magnifying those differences. I feel we have not been this divided since our Civil War 150 years ago. Oh, I could go on about how I feel about America Day, how it has slipped away from what I and the others had in mind so many years ago in that convention in Philadelphia. And it's not out of an ego that I recommend that my farewell address to the country be mandatory reading. And lastly, let me just say that many regard me as the first in war, the first in peace, and the first in the hearts of his countrymen. But I would like to remind Americans that they are the first in my heart. I look forward to when more and more of them truly embrace that all men and women are created equal and they have the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without denying those same rights to others. Words of wisdom from a man whom many consider to be the father of his country. So until our next Chatting with History, I'm Dan Gersten, thankful for what George and the other Founding Fathers did for all of us and this country of ours. Thank you for watching. Talk to me. Talk to me.